humanitarian aid to the peer or at least through the inspection process? Yep. Thanks, Lita, for the question. So um, in terms of an update on JLOTS, um, so as of today, uh, we are over 50% complete on setting up the peer. The floating peer, you, you'll remember there are a few different components to this peer and the JLOTS um, operation. The floating peer has been um, completely constructed and set up. The causeway is in progress. Um, so in terms of uh, date of delivery, we've said from the beginning, uh, early May, um, we still believe that we're on track to meet that, but I don't have an exact date for you on when humanitarian aid, when we're going to see those first trucks going into Gaza. Um, but as soon as I have that date for you, um, we are, of course, going to keep you updated on that. All right, come in the room. Tom. Um, Along the lines of the pier, uh, do we have any sense of which country would be driving the trucks along the causeway to the beach? And once the trucks get to the beach, is it the World Food Program that will be distributing the aid? Uh, thanks, Tom, for the question. So in terms of um, distribution on the ground, uh, it will be the UN that is distributing the aid. Um, but for more on that... For more on that, I would direct you more to the UN to speak to that. Um, again, they'll be the ones on the ground doing that, that work. Um, in terms of the drivers, as we've said, it will be a third party. Um, some parties don't necessarily want to be named publicly. I'd let others speak to that. Um, but right now, I can just tell you that it, was, it will be a third party and not um, U.S. forces driving those trucks off the pier. Anne. Hi. So, uh, clarification on that. Who's going to provide the security for the World Food Program workers? Are, is that clarified yet? Is that going to be the Israeli Defense Force? And then also the, um, the Israelis, have they given you any assurance on if they've changed their rules of engagement on uh, to prevent another strike on aid workers? Are there any assurances that that's not going to happen again, what happened a month ago? So in terms of, I think you're referring to what happened to the world central kitchen workers, um, you know, we have seen the IDF take some steps um, to prevent something like that from happening. We have also their investigation that we are reviewing ourselves, um, and that is an interagency effort. So I don't have uh, more to share with you on where we are and, you know, reading out our um, sort of assessment of that investigation, but the IDF has shown that they are they are taking steps to, to mitigate that from happening again. Um, as you know, we've also set up a deconfliction cell. Um, so that is very important to ensure that aid workers are uh, given the protective security that they need to move within Gaza to distribute that aid. Um, U.S. forces will not be on the ground, so that is um, the IDF will be leading the security efforts on the ground when it also comes to that distribution. Great. Oren. At, at this point, um, for the U.S. assets involved in the construction, are U.S. force protection measures in place? Are they en route, or, or where does that process stand? So as you can appreciate, we, of course, are, um, as the Secretary has said many times before, he takes force protection very seriously. So uh, while I won't get into our own force protection, um, our assets are en route. They are going to be ready to set up um, and, and stab that Gaza coastline when, when that causeway is fully uh, constructed. Um, but I just won't get into those specific force prote protection measures that we are taking right now. And as you know, that the IDF has um, given us our their assurances that they will be providing security um, for our forces once that pier and causeway are operational. You said our assets are en route. Obviously, some are there. Can you detail what is still en route? I would direct you to CENTCOM to speak more to the assets that are that are moving. Again, this is involving two different uh COCOMs between UCOM and Central Command, as well as Transcom is providing the assets. So um, I would direct you to CENTCOM for more specific details on, on the, where ships are. Um, I'm going to go to the phones and then come back in the room. Uh, JJ Green, WTOP. Okay. If not, uh, Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks for your time. Uh, oh, hi, Sorry about that. Yeah, Did I'm I miss back my to you. Day? We'll go to JJ first. That's oh, fine. I'm sorry. Um, Russia is trying to take advantage of the gap between approval of the weapons package that's intended for Ukraine and the actual delivery of these weapons. We've seen a number of different uh, attacks in places that are very vulnerable right now. And we've also heard from the Ukrainian 
military that they know that these weapons are going to make a difference and Russia knows it. So can you give us an update on the delivery of weapons and, 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 and items that this package would make it available for them? Thanks, JJ, for the question. Um, as soon as we were able to announce that $1 billion PDA, um, you've heard the secretary and the president speak to this. Um, we had pre-positioned some uh, weapons and capabilities. Um, so we were ready to support Ukraine almost immediately when that PDA was announced. So uh, whether it was air defenses, artillery, ammunition, that continues to flow to Ukraine, um, but it is was almost pretty immediate um, on getting into Ukraine. In terms of getting to the front lines, um, getting to the units that need them the most, that's really something that Ukraine can speak to um, more. So I direct you to, to the Ukrainian uh, forces to, to really speak to that. But um, you've seen us flow PDA packages, um, getting materials into Ukraine, sometimes within hours, if not a day or two. Um, and so that's what we were ready for. And while we did wait for the supplemental, and that did take months to get across the finish line, um, we were certainly able to uh, surge that aid uh, when the president signed out that presidential drawdown package. And um, just last week, we announced another longer term commitment to Ukraine um, uh, to the tune of $6 billion in USAI. Uh, that will take longer to re reach Ukraine. But um, again, that's for the long term commitment to them. Um, as we have shown uh, time and time again, that we are invested in Ukraine's short term and long term future. And with that, I will go to Dan Lamoth, uh, Washington Post. Uh, thank you. Uh Two loose ends, uh, looking to see if there's any update with the situation in Niger and the talks that were ongoing. And then uh, secondly, looking for any kind of update on whether there's been any kind of uh, additional attack or threat either on uh, pier and causeway assets or on the staging uh, facility on the beach. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, in terms of any additional attacks, I'm not tracking any at this moment. Um, I would direct you to the IDF to speak to that in terms of uh, within the vicinity of where the pier uh, will be set up. But I, at, at this time, I'm just not um, tracking anything additional. Um, in terms of Niger, uh, sort of in the same place that we were last week, um, the State Department, a representative from U.S. AFRICOM, did hold meetings. Um, we are waiting to send our uh, another delegation to Niger. Um, that delegation has not left, um, but they were they should be scheduled hopefully to leave this week, um, and that will be to continue to to have those conversations about withdrawing U.S. forces. But um, no major updates right now. Uh, when there are updates, of course, we will provide those. Yeah, Janie. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, the Defense Secretary Austin said at the Congressional hearing that North Korea has gained confidence due to its close relationship with uh, Russian President Putin and is uh, concerned about its uh, solidarity with China, Russia, and Iran. What measures will the United States take to prevent military cooperation from these countries? Yeah, Janie, I, I don't have much more to uh, add to what the Secretary said in front of Congress yesterday. I think he spoke uh, quite well to this, is that uh, we are concerned. We're certainly concerned about the deepening relationship that the DPRK and Russia have that uh, together with Iran, that that is fueling um, Russia on the battlefield in Ukraine as they continue to wage this illegal war um, and kill many innocent Ukrainian civilians. Um, so in terms of what we are doing as the United States, we continue to monitor um, the Department of Defense. Of course, you've seen us strengthen our own relationships with the ROC within the region. Um, we continue to arm Ukraine with the weapons it needs on the battlefield. And then across the interagency, you've seen from the Treasury Department announcing more sanctions on uh, whether it be Russia, DPRK, um, and others. So I, we certainly take this seriously, um, and we're continuing to monitor as a department. Uh, do you have any information about Russia recruiting North Korean mercenary for war with Ukraine? I don't have any information on that. I haven't seen any uh, uh, reports on that. But that being said, we certainly know that the DPRK is willing to support Russia in um, in its fight against Ukraine. Um, and that is one country supporting Russia along with Iran. Uh, you have over 50 
countries and partners supporting Ukraine in its fight. Um, and that's, you know, what you saw last week with the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. The secretary um, announced additional commitments there. Um, and so while we see the DPRK uh, supporting Russia's efforts, um, the United States is uh, always proud to stand tall with Ukraine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. So yesterday, Chinese Coast Guard have fired water cannon at two Philippine vessels, and which is elaborated tension in South China Sea. And tomorrow, Secretary Austin will meet Japan and the Philippine Defense Minister in Hawaii to strengthen commitment to the region. But what does the Pentagon expect Japan to do to maintain security in this region? Well, look, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the Japanese government. I would refer you to them to speak to any actions that they're taking. Um, what you're seeing, though, tomorrow with the secretary's meeting between the Philippines, Australia, Japan, um, it's a second meeting of this type that's being held. So what you're seeing is the deepening of cooperation and uh, security ties, and that's incredibly important in the region. Um, in terms to what you're referring to, I mean, we have and will continue to be clear with Beijing um, that these actions by the PRC put uh, Filipino crews in danger. Uh, they've caused injuries. They've caused damage. They're complete disregard and violation of international law. And so we stand firm with our Philippine, um, with the Philippines and our commitment to the mutual defense treaty. Um, and we're, and we really are doing historic work with Manila. Um, we're supporting their military modernization. We're, we're coordinating at every level of government. And so that's something that you're going to see with Secretary Austin tomorrow. Yet again, another conversation building on the relationship, um, from the past, you know, over the last four years. Great. I'm going to go to the phones here. We have a few more here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. Uh, Mali claims that it has killed Abu Huzaifa, an ISIS leader who played a role in the October 27 Niger ambush. I'm wondering, has Mali provided the Defense Department any information to confirm this, or has the Defense Department been able to independently confirm that this uh, ISIS leader is killed? And do you have any information about what exactly the role he played in the ambush? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for the question. Um, I'm I'm sorry, I just don't have any information for you on this. Um, you know, I, I I I've seen I've seen some of the reports, but I just don't have anything to provide on on this at this time. Uh, Sam Legrone, USNI. Hey, Sabrina. Um, over the last uh, week or so, we're seeing um, pretty much a daily attacks from the Houthis expanding as far out uh, as the Indian Ocean. Uh, in particular, the suspected attack on MSC Orion looks like it's it's pretty uh, far away from kind of the traditional Red Sea um, areas of attack. Are are y'all looking to you know sort of expand the scope of Prosperity Guardian or any of the other sort of deterrent patrols or protection patrols um, beyond kind of the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden and get into the Indian Ocean? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sam, uh, for the question. So I've seen the reports on um, an attack in the Indian Ocean. I just can't confirm those. Um, as of right now, Operation Prosperity Guardian is focused on the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, uh, the BAM, um, and working very effectively and efficiently with um, over 20 different uh countries. So um, right now, the mission remains the same. Uh, should the mission change, of course, we would update you on that. Um, but since you gave me the opportunity, I will take it that um, the Houthis continue to endanger commercial shipping that goes through that region, com continue to put at risk um, U.S. forces, other countries' forces in the region who want to see commerce continue to flow in a very crucial area um, in the Middle East. And so um, our our teams uh, in, in the CENTCOM area of responsibility continue to work around the clock, uh, defending commercial shipping, uh, protecting our, our, our forces, and um, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, coming back in the room. Okay, great. Short briefing today. Thanks, everyone.